in her TED Talk, The Danger of a Single Story, the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie recounts an experience she had while promoting her first novel in the United States. She says, I recently spoke at a university where a student told me that it was such a shame that Nigerian men were physical abusers, like the father character in my novel, Purple Hibiscus. I told him that I had just read a novel called American Psycho, <laughs> and that it was such a shame that all young Americans were serial murderers. <laughs> now, Adichie admits to saying this in a fit of mild irritation. But this story was a powerful reminder for me that there is no single story that we can tell about anything in life. And in particular, that also meant for me that ideas about what constitutes a good society inevitably emerges from the tapestry of narratives that we weave every day of our lives. Genuine discourse and dialogue may seem like a very simple thing, and it often does yield more questions than answers. But I believe it is a crucial piece in our daily attempt at building a better society. In order to have these meaningful conversations, I first needed to clarify where I stood on issues that mattered to me. And the way I did that was through writing poems. Ever since I wrote my first poem three years ago about wanting to transfer to Swarthmore College, I have turned time and again to poetry as a means of figuring out things that I don't quite yet understand. Ultimately, I believe that such poetry is meant to be shared because it is only by pooling our diverse understandings about the world that we can learn to live better with one another. In the next 15 minutes or so, I wish to share with you all a few poems, a few conversations that have been and continue to be important to me. As much as I love poetry, there was a time when I thought of poetry as somewhat elitist and even inaccessible. Growing up reading the works of white male poets such as William Butler Yeats and Ted Hughes, I had always revered these figures whose works I did not always fully comprehend and whom I believed had done something special to deserve the title poet. During my time at Swarthmore, I have discovered on the contrary how poetry can be an incredible democratizing force as well as an inspiring tool for social change. More importantly, I have come to realize that there is, in fact, a poet in each and every one of us. What does it mean to be a poet? To feel and reflect, to express yourself in words, and to be willing to connect to others through sharing your thoughts and experiences. More often than not, I tend to find that poetic inspiration comes from the most mundane of places. This first poem that I'm about to share with you all came to me as I was walking my dog this past summer when I was at home in Hong Kong. There is a huge Chinese banyan tree along the roadside where I took my dog every morning. And that particular day, I remember passing by that very same tree and noticing for the first time how its roots, which protruded far above the ground, looked eerily like the arteries of a human being. I believe that we all experience these seemingly ordinary moments in life. And the beauty of poetry is that it does not have to come from someplace extraordinary. And this first poem is called The Taming. The heart is a forest that many have tried to tame. Sometimes it's the incessant humming of insects that bothers them, teeming in the water, soil, and air, too easily killed, but too vast to ever be crushed. Other times, it's the way the wind sifts through the undergrowth, overturning jagged pieces of rock to expose their smooth, taut underbellies. Once, it was simply the way the air was pungent with loam and leaf and light that made them stop in their tracks like deer blinded by headlights. Only that the deer would die because of the lights, and they knew they'd die for want of it. Those who have tried it will tell you that there is only one way to tame a forest. Abandon your fingers at the forest's edge. The life that throbs through the trees is too strong for the chipping away of bark to matter. 
Mobilize armies of steel and flesh fusing till steel-tipped fingers pry the arteries open at the roots. Start building roads of concrete. The undergrowth's too heavy with life, so you have to choke it with something it cannot possibly digest. I used to think of politics and poetry as belonging to two entirely distinct realms. I associated politics with what was pragmatic, and poetry with what was more abstract and therefore less consequential. Years later, I came across Adrienne Rich's poem, Dreamwood, in which she writes, poetry isn't revolution, but a way of knowing why it must come. Through reading her works and the works of other activist poets, I've come to the realization that the kind of poetry which matters most are those which are rooted in our daily struggles over things such as love, loss, and the quest to find meaning in life. Poetry has been a means for me to probe deeper into my own desires and dreams. And while they might very well differ from yours, I believe that our stories are all relatable at the root because of our capacity to empathize and imagine. I wish to dedicate this next poem to Adrian Rich, who passed away this Tuesday in Santa Cruz, California at the age of 82. Reading her poetry has been a life-changing experience for me. And I wish for us to take a moment to honor this incredible human being who, through her life's work, constantly sought to remind us of our common humanity. This next poem is called Choices. You told me today that you no longer wish to become a doctor because you realized that one sharp wrong turn of a knife could take away a life. You told me you'd rather deal with numbers on a screen because even if you messed up, it doesn't really hurt anyone. I wanted to tell you then, but had to struggle to find the words because our friendship was stretched up between us like a tightrope that I did not know how to cross. When you nor I could meet one another halfway. I wanted to tell you then that the man across the street recently had to leave a place he had called home for the past 30 years because someone had deliberately messed up some numbers, told him he had nothing to fear by purchasing another mortgage. I wanted to tell you then that another child is going hungry tonight because someone decided that speculating on agricultural crops would be a sound investment that changing prices here, where people are hungry for a fairer future, can mean no food on the table tonight, or tomorrow, or the day after, over there. Now, a pulsing geography of pain, which that man easily bypasses on his private jet. It can mean the weight of a weightless body, in the arms of a mother who no longer knows what she can do to help her children live when she is not considered competitive enough to deserve to make a living. It is not easy to tell someone you're close to something you think they won't necessarily want to hear. I'm sure you've all had similar experiences where you wanted to say something to a close friend or a loved one, but didn't end up doing so because it was uncomfortable. I still struggle with this even now, but I think if I could go back to that day, I would have told my friend what was on my mind, because I believe we could have both learned something had I chosen to speak. Speaking up means putting yourself out there to be judged, and that is vulnerable. For me, poetry has been a way of channeling that vulnerability into something constructive, a voice for my hopes, fears, and dreams that might potentially resonate with someone, somewhere. This next poem is called, How We Began With I, and How To Get Back To Us. Standing alone, I wonder how it feels to be part of something bigger than yourself, 
to realize that a drop of water only gains strength from merging with other droplets to form rivers, oceans. They say 60% of the human body is made up of water. And I wonder how we still live believing the myth that we don't need anyone else to survive. If it were so, we wouldn't have invented language, wouldn't need a heart. I was told that the word courage came from the Latin word core. It meant telling others your story wholeheartedly. I wish we lived wholeheartedly, but we are always afraid to feel vulnerable. To feel anything at all feels like falling, and we fear the hurt that comes with not knowing whether there will be someone to catch our fall or whether we will simply end up with scraped knees or hearts. But I am always reminded of the words of the poet Audre Lloyd who said, when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. I'd like to give an example uh, of a conversation that could have ended badly, but turned out to be one of the most memorable instances of human connection that I've ever experienced. When I was studying abroad in the UK last spring, I made a new friend on the streets of Geneva as I was trying to find my way to the castle ruins. My new friend, who I shall call Eva, ended up spending the entire afternoon with me. And as we sat by the lake, we talked about religion and politics. And somewhere in that conversation, the subject of homosexuality came up. When I asked her what she thought about it, she said, well, I personally don't think that people who are gay seem that different from me. But the Bible does say that homosexuality is a sin, so it must be wrong. At that moment, my phone rang. It was my friend who had just gotten off work. A part of me really wanted to stay to discuss this further, but I had to go. And before I hugged her and said goodbye, I remember asking her, what can be wrong about two people loving one another? This next poem is for Eva, to continue the conversation we never got to finish. And it is called Freedom. We live entangled in a web of words, the he's and she's scalded onto unwilling skin by merciless eyes that dare us to say otherwise. Last night I boarded a train, witnessed myself being borne towards a distant, more compassionate future. The hurt remains, the weight of knowing that elsewhere these words will need to be choked back, even though I want to breathe them like the air I rely on for survival. It might seem like a very simple thing, sitting in the dark in front of a silver screen, bearing witness to how a girl's desire to love was reduced to sin. The protagonist's words, heartbreak opens unto the sunrise, for even breaking is opening, and I am broken, I am open. These words are the soundtrack I will continue to play amidst the beating of drums, every beat driving deeper, the shame. You are a woman, and God does not make mistakes. Yesterday, I walked into that silent room with my head held high. Every step, a thread, a letter, a note. This tapestry of song will be ready someday, but the world needs more music of this kind, so I know I will never stop singing. Now into my last semester at Swarthmore, I've been thinking a lot about what I wish to experience and accomplish during the next stage of my life. One day, I came across a quote in a book called Do It Anyway by Courtney Martin, which said, one's vocation in life should be where one's deepest gladness meets the world's deepest hunger. When I asked myself what my deepest gladness was, I knew the answer right away. I knew I loved to write. But I didn't know what the world's deepest hunger was, and I suspected that whatever it was, poetry could hardly measure up to the task. In the face of problems such as poverty and injustice, 
what could poetry have to offer? This next poem is one of my attempts at answering this question, and it is called, What I Choose to Need, or What is Needed Here? I do not normally read like this. Fingers kneading the pages, eyes probing the words, and the spaces between the words for a reason why I should keep doing this. The sound of footsteps and I instinctively shut these words out, dreading the inevitable question, what are you doing? The telephone rings and I race to answer it because it is answerable. Unlike the questions you and I have been afraid to ask of ourselves and of one another. Why is it that when you're told by a man to need numbers on a mutating screen so it would fit his expectations, you call it work. But when you need words on a page because you need them, sitting in a rare moment of solitude in a corner of your room, you call it idleness. Some say, but poetry produces nothing. GDP does not recognize poetry. She, according to he, is unregistered, undocumented, unaccounted for. Some ask, can words feed a family of five? I reply, there are other ways of starving. They say it takes a village to raise a child. I believe it takes a community to sustain us spiritually and emotionally if we are to have these thoughtful yet sometimes incredibly difficult conversations with those around us and others who we would care to know better. Describing a scene at the New York and Poets Cafe in the Lower East Side of New York City, Adrian Rich writes, wide as a social political, aesthetic differences were among the poets and among their hearers. A community arose in that undertaking, under harsh lights, with a sometimes wayward mic. Poetry lived, pulling us towards each other. When we start to see poetry as the physical manifestation of our human connections, we can begin to understand what the Mexican scholar Gustavo Esteva meant when he said at a recent talk at Swarthmore that there is no you or I, only different kinds of we. This last poem is for you all, and it is called What I Am Fighting For. Sometimes I think I am fighting for those who lie in their beds at night, shivering, not because it is cold, but because they can feel the creaks of the door in their bones, remembering the night the soldiers came, their boots leaving behind permanent marks in the mud. Sometimes I think I am fighting for the earth that bleeds out its hurt in the melting snow caps and overflowing rivers, fighting for the trees whose arteries have been plucked out at the roots by steel-tipped fingers. But there are times Times like these, as I stand in a room amidst a community of beings willing to offer up their bodies as prisms through which the truth shines through and is set free. I know I am fighting for nothing more, nothing less than this. Thank you.